Y'all wanted to know about the image quality on the brand new Sony A9 Mark III. See, it has a global shutter, which is an entirely different type of sensor. And in the past, video cameras and such with global shutters have had worse dynamic range, worse high ISO performance. Well, I got my hands on the raw processor thanks to the updated version of Adobe Lightroom. I'm covering sharpness, dynamic range, high ISO noise for both stills and video. But let's start with sharpness at the base ISO. I'm comparing it primarily to the Sony A1. The Sony A1 has similar image quality to just about every other camera there because it has a stack sensor, similar image quality to an A7R5, but it's a sports camera. It's about the same price. So there's a lot of overlap in the functionality. I think people will be cross shopping them starting at the base ISO here. Zooming in on the Maven logo here, we can definitely see more detail zooming in on the 50 megapixel A1 files than we can on the 24 megapixel a9 files. Looking at our resolution chart, the A1 shows the detail at the maximum resolution of these lines, whereas it gets muddled. But you can see one of the disadvantages of dealing with highly detailed files like this is lots of moiré. The A1 shows tons of moiré in these patterns here. Just look at the green and magenta patterns, whereas the lower resolution A9 doesn't show that because it's just not enough detail. Moiré is the color fringing caused by the red, green, and blue on the bear pattern on the sensor. I do see some moiré on the A9, but I'm guessing it has a fairly heavy anti-aliasing filter, which is typical for sports cameras like this because sports photographers can't be dealing with moiré when they're shooting 120 frames per second and they're just trying to get stuff off to the editor. How about dynamic range at the base ISO? I'll raise both of these by three stops so we can peer into the shadows and see what detail hides in there. This is really common for portrait photography, especially wedding photographers often have to bring up the shadows in dark tuxedos. Wildlife photographers uh, often you're shooting against a bright sky, a dark bird, and you have to bring up the shadows to show the details in the wings. So this is pretty important. In these recover shadows, the A1 is definitely way cleaner. The noise is less chunkier. It's far more detailed. The detail of the fine lines of the lens is more visible on the A1 than it is on the A9. Now, the A9's base ISO is ISO 250, and the A1's base ISO is ISO 100. ISO 100 is allowing the A1 to gather more light and that is a big advantage of it. Because the A1 can gather more than twice as much light, it's getting more detail in both bright and dark parts of the picture, and that is translating to better dynamic range. I did test these both at ISO 250, and when I do so, the dynamic range and stuff is pretty similar. So to me, that means the A9's dynamic range is about a stop and a third behind, consistent with the difference in the base ISO. And that is almost exactly the difference in dynamic range between a full frame camera and an APS-C camera. So you might think about the A9 as providing the dynamic range of an APS-C camera in ideal conditions when you're shooting at the base ISO. Here's another example just showing how much more detail you'll get out of the A1 than you will the A9. What about in low light conditions like ISO 25600? Let's check it out. In the well exposed parts of the image, the 50 megapixel A1 looks substantially better than the 24 megapixel A9 Mark III. Again, this is primarily due to the use of the global shutter. It seems like it just isn't as sensitive in low light conditions. We see some of the same artifacts as before, like lots of more ray on the A1, which is definitely a pain. That is not a problem on the A9 Mark III, so that's one advantage to the lower megapixel. But if we look at the noise patterns in the magenta here, it's definitely more contrast, chunkier noise. And again, I think the A9 Mark III is about a stop behind the other full frame cameras that we would compare it to, and that puts it on par with an APS-C camera. So in those conditions, when you're pushing the dynamic range, I think it's safe to think of the A9 Mark III as providing APS-C-like image quality, which isn't that bad. It's generally going to be good enough for the ways that it's going to be used, things like sports photography. Now let's check out high ISO video at ISO 25,600. I compared the A1, the A9 Mark III, and the Sony A7R5 all at 4K 60 and ISO 25,600. And to me here, the A9 Mark III really excels. I think it looks really good. It's able to process all of the data from the sensor. If you're interested in the A9, subscribe to our channel because I have a video coming out in just a few days showing off how the global shutter works with high speed flash and how it competes against traditional focal plane shutters and the leaf shutter in a Hasselblad X2D100C. The results are really 
interesting. And in the comments down below, let me know what else you want to know about the A9 Mark III for our upcoming reviews. Oh, we have a wildlife A9 Mark III review coming soon too. Bye.